Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome CEO of Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Karen Tucker. I'm CEO of the Churchill Club. Our program tonight is called Technology and Transformation. We have Vishal Sika, Alan Kay, and Paul Sappho. We're very privileged to have with us these three distinguished individuals. Thank you so much. It can only go downhill from here now. And I would also like to extend a big thank you to SAP for their partnership and their generosity in making this program possible. Thank you. And finally, one more important thank you. Edelman PR played a big role in shepherding tonight's program, and we appreciate their partnership as well. A brief introduction for our new guests in the audience. Churchill Club is Silicon Valley's premier independent business and technology forum, has been convening unique Silicon Valley style conversations since 1985. And what drives us every day is to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we do this through the up to 40 programs that we present each year that are designed to connect people with each other and with ideas. We are a member-supported nonprofit, and we would welcome your participation. We have an outstanding set of programs coming up over the next two months starting with Silicon Valley's Secret Sauce on April 2nd, the Great Silicon Valley Oxford Union Debate on April 11th, that has a healthcare theme, the future of work with the CEOs of Box and Jive on April 25. We have Shell Oil Company President Marvin Odom coming on May 1st, the ARM President and soon-to-be CEO Simon Seegers coming on uh, May 9th, and the 15th annual Top 10 Trends event on May 23rd. And these are just some of the programs coming down the pike. So be sure to get on our mailing list or keep a close eye on the website as new programs get posted. If you are tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club and you'll find other Twitter codes in your printed program. Now I will introduce our speakers starting with Alan Kay. Alan is a well-known and respected technology pioneer who made early and fundamental contributions to object-oriented programming, personal computing, and graphical user interfaces. He has received numerous awards, including the Turing Award, which is widely considered to be the Nobel Prize of Computing. Alan has held fellow positions at a number of companies, including HP, Disney, Apple, and Xerox, and he served as chief scientist at Atari, and today, he continues his work at Viewpoints Research, where among his many notable contributions, he advances powerful ideas education for the world's children. Vishal Sika is a member of the executive board of SAP, and he heads technology and innovation for the company. He has responsibility for driving forward SAP's technology and platform products, which includes database, especially the industry breakthrough in-memory database, SAP HANA. Vishal oversees key partnerships, customer co-innovation, and also incubation of emerging businesses. And prior to SAP, Vishal had a very diverse background in research and also founded two startup companies. Our moderator, Paul Sappho, is a world-renowned and respected forecaster and leading authority on the dynamics of large-scale, long-term change. Paul is Managing Director of Foresight at Discern Analytics, and he teaches at Stanford University, where he is a consulting associate professor. He serves on a variety of nonprofit boards, and one of them, I'm proud to say, is the Churchill Club. We look forward to the conversation that Paul will lead for us tonight. Please welcome our speakers. Thank you so much. Thanks. Years ago, a, a close friend, Richard Werman, once described the conference he built as the dinner party that he always wanted to have. 
And as I was preparing for this evening, I thought, no, this is one better. This is the dinner conversation I always wanted to have with these two close friends. And, and also, I, I think I can say that one gets to a certain age and, and you end up talking about the past a lot. And <laughs> I certainly do. <laughs> Yes, I like to think of Alan as a futurist <laughs> with the past. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we will get into a little history tonight, but, um, but this evening is about looking forward, um, in invoking another historic um, uh, event. Benivar Bush wrote a, a report in the mid-1940s to the president titled Science Endless Frontiers. And that sense that lots was going on, but things had just barely begun. And I think that's how all three of us feel right now. This revolution is a couple of decades old, but it seems like it is just gaining speed. And the transformations ahead are going to cause the transformations we've been through already uh, to, to pale by comparison. Uh, so, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. That's what they're going to talk about, and I'm going to keep a light hand as a moderator. Uh, before we begin, though, let me just check here. Um, how many people in this room have worked with Alan uh, in, in the past? Raise your hands. That's the less than that. How many people had their lives changed? Oh, no, no, come on. <laughs> okay, I won't do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. By Vishal. <laughs> Besides Vishal, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So let me get, get right into it. Um, start with, uh, uh, well, wait, I have to complain. How many people have worked for Vishal, worked with Vishal? Alan? Oh, all of them out here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so bigger influence in I this room. I think you room. salted the audience. Uh, influence, uh, you know, the, the social graph clearly goes to Vishal in this room, so I hope you have something to say, Alan. But, um, <laughs> Let's, let's start with a piece of history. Um, we were talking earlier, and uh, you both have been af greatly affected by visions of, of other people in this revolution. Alan, famously, you, you said that uh, attending Doug Engelbart's famous uh, demonstration in San Francisco, which we're just coming up on the 45th anniversary of, uh, was, was life-changing for you. We'll get back to those, but let's talk about the visions that we should still be mining. What are the things that we haven't picked up from history in terms of the visions that have yet to come to pass and the ideas that we should all be looking at? Well, I think visions, even when they're escaping from the context one is in, arise from the context one is in. And so I think the, the visions that attracted me of Licklider and Ivan Sutherland and Doug Engelbart were um, visions about that came out of the Cold War and were funded by an almost unlimited amount of money that uh, the DOD had at its disposal. So much money that uh, open-ended research was also funded by it. And so the people who had these visions were uh, not trying to make money. They realized, of course, that you, invention gives rise to money, but in fact, uh, they were interested in improving the human condition. The Licklider said in one of his uh, writings, uh, in a few years, people will be able to think in more and better ways than they ever had before because they will have a complementary intellectual amplifier to help them think with called the computer. Most of us would not recognize today's use of computers as anything remotely like that. <clears throat> it's not what it's about. And when computers got commercialized, almost all of the routes that were taken uh, from the inventions were routes that involved making money. First with business, because the money was there for buying <coughs> things in the two to $4,000 to $10,000 range. And then as Moore's Law crept on, the consumer 
range of prices was looked at, and that's where we're in the middle right now. And by and large, the people who are trying to make money out of it uh, tend to lack vision beyond belief because the business is actually not rewarded for doing good. Otherwise, the tobacco companies would be long gone. Businesses are rewarded for making money, and because that reward system is in place, and because the funding that happened in the 60s and the 70s doesn't exist anymore, almost all the efforts in uh, inventing and innovating now are looking for the next marketplace to sell things, and usually an unsophisticated marketplace because marketing people hate learning curves. Yes. They don't. Jonathan? So it'd be it, so it'd be very very difficult to invent something like the bicycle and make it work today. Because think of the lawyers would worry about the lawsuits and the marketing people would worry. Oh, it takes a few weeks to learn how to do it, and the parents would have to help. And it's just completely anti what uh, what is thought of as a good product today. So I I think that the context. Mm -hmm. and gives rise to the visions, and, and I'm an old fart, and so I still like the idea of making humanity better, helping humanity work together better, learn how to communicate better, but I think it's hard to find in the, the realm of activity that's, that's going on right now. And so when we look into the future and think about visions for the future, uh, we have to pick what axis our vision is. Is, is it the vision of some large house or car or something, or, or is, is it a world uh, that is not at war? Is it a world that is actually cooperating rather than uh, competing? I, I did bring a, a Winston Churchill story. I don't think Winston Churchill would recognize the Churchill Club because... <laughs> was, it's he's, nothing he's, like he's, it when he was in, a member. Uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> Most people He's don't. Totally transformed. You know, he was uh, billed as a man of the people, but most people don't realize that uh, there was a never a day in Churchill's life where he actually dressed himself. He had servants for his entire lifetime, and he lived most of the re most of the last part of his life in one of the largest palaces, Blenheim Palace, uh, in England. So he was um, he was a commoner, but an upper class commoner. But here's a great story I think is a good one for our times. So he was at a party. He liked to sip whiskey in reasonable quantities, and so he was off to the side sipping whiskey. And the hostess of the party came over to him extremely agitated and said, Mr. Churchill, I saw this famous earl over here steal one of my silver salt shakers. What should I do? And Churchill thought for a minute, he stuck his cigar in his mouth and he went over to the, towards the Earl and along the way he picked up a salt shaker and put it in his pocket and <laughs> got over to the Earl and he took it out and he says, I think we've been noticed, perhaps we should put these back. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so the, so the answer is for the visions of the future, I vote for cooperation rather than competition. Cooperation, here, here. That is. Uh, so Vishal, as Alan was talking, I thought, he's absolutely right. This, this balance between doing well and doing good is, is difficult even here in Silicon Valley and, and oftentimes the doing good seems to happen quite by accident. But you've, you've done a marvelous job of, of keeping a balance between doing well and doing good and you still have your job. Uh, so <laughs> what's the secret? They haven't caught on to it yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, just remember this is Chatham House rules. Don't anybody tell anyone at any <laughs> But how do you balance that? I think uh, it is our imperative to balance that. Um, Alan and I were talking about this earlier today. Um, as managers and as leaders, uh, I mean, the kind of job that I have, it is extremely easy to burn all 24 hours of the day doing the, you know, uh, the things that are right in front of you and the fires that have to be fought and the, uh, the issues that have to be resolved. And it is our burden to ensure that the big things get done. And, and email the, doesn't make that easier? Email makes it much worse, <laughs> especially the kind of email that I have. I have, well, I uh, gave my phones to Abdul. 
the um, you have these phones and they don't uh, talk to each other. Uh, between those two phones, I have six different pieces of software communicating things to me from various people and it is my personal, I have to personally organize my attention across all six of them. There isn't a way that I have of simply putting together a single, you know, funnel to grab all six of them. So, there are very fundamental ways in which we are still living in the dark ages and um, I think as managers and leaders, it is our burden to make sure that we uh, continuously think about things that are um, important. The, you know, we, we, we live, <coughs> Paul McGreedy, who was a great friend of Alan's, um, once said, he gave a great talk at, at TED, I think. This is Paul McCready, Gossamer Albatross. Yes, Gossamer Albatross. Everyone knows who Paul McCready is. You want to just say a little bit here. Man-powered flight. Yeah, responsible for the first man-powered flight. And we, we got to, well, there's a story you're going to have to tell about this, but continue. <laughs> No, I mean, Paul McGreedy did this very straightforward but profound analysis of the human condition and he said that uh, um, we are basically operating the planet, I mean, humans are operating the planet as if, um, you know, uh, we control the whole thing and uh, we have um, unbelievably disproportionate consumption of resources compared to any other species ever um, and he came to some startling conclusion, which if you haven't seen this, it would be a good talk to to, to watch and um, uh, our philosophy has been, my philosophy has been that life is too short to just work on uh, the basic problems, the ones that are right in front of us, but instead to step back every once in a while and think about the things that are important and that matter um, and that are based on principles of uh, the great people that came before us uh, that they have learned and, and you know spend our time doing those. The interesting thing is that um, uh, usually when you, when you work with those principles, um, in fact also commercially good things happen. So, so this is not, it, it appears that you know, um, working on purposeful important things is uh, somehow not commercially beneficial, but that is, that is not the case. Um, you know, it, it, is, it is possible to do both, but as long as uh, we think about, um, I will give you one example. Please. Uh, we have, when I joined SAP, we had about, it was about 11 years ago, we had a hundred or so customers that were our customers for all 30 years of SAP's existence. Um, and uh, now we are, you know, 41 years old and uh, um, we haven't lost, many of those companies went out of business, but we did not lose a single one of them. So when you do business with a customer for like decades, you operate differently. You don't tend to have this, um, you know, let's strip mine this joint for whatever it is worth and then go to the next one, uh, that kind of a mindset. You, you think about a more sustainable long-term kind of a relationship and, and that is something that I, I think it's also in the uh, best interest of every, everyone um, in, in the long run. But going back to the very start, when you started talking, walking into it, one would assume that the, the stereotype of of the blocks to transformation is the tension between, well, the way I think about it in Silicon Valley, that every entrepreneur has a little angel on one shoulder whispering in their ear, change the world, change the world. And on the other shoulder is a little devil saying, get rich, get rich. And, uh, and it's how you resolve that conversation that determines your success. And in a large company, the, the pressure is, of course, uh, the bottom line. What I'm hearing you saying is that the challenge to to transformation and hitting the big issues is less the question of the bottom line and more just the pressures of the present, the, the email, the day-to-day -day demands on time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we are, uh, especially in bigger companies, but even in the, in the smaller companies here in the Valley, we, are, we have been led to believe that there is this innovator's dilemma and therefore it is okay for us to not reinvent ourselves. Oh, because, you know, we were disrupted and somebody else came in and disrupted us so what can I do, you know, I'm just a poor manager, I got disrupted. So you're um, a big fan of the innovators dilemma. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think, um, <laughs> maybe Alan, you can weigh in on this too. Well, I'm not uh, so a big I'm fan. Not out. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think that there is no innovators dilemma. I think that uh, the innovators dilemma, the notion that uh, it is okay for us to get disrupted, that there is somehow some kind of a natural law driving disruption is, is, is nonsense. Um, it is up to us to renew ourselves, to continuously rethink ourselves, 
uh, just because we are a, a big company, it doesn't mean that you know you stop stop thinking, you stop innovating or, or inventing new things. Uh, it is it is not easy um, to be well, sure. Well, you've you've encoded this in software. I mean, it's into the yeah. architecture. Yeah, I mean, what I have learned, you know, from from Alan and from from my teachers, um, uh, timeless software is is this this notion. I mean, Alan always told me the internet is a great example of a system that. Uh, every bit and every atom in the internet has changed itself many, many times over and yet it is the same. Is it the same internet or is it a different internet? It is, it is both, you know, is New York an old city or a new city? Um, it is both, you don't, you know, that New York doesn't have a version and you don't have to reboot New York to um, um, or go through an impl implementation project that could, we are changing we, the version of New York. Actually, could we reboot Washington? <laughs> So, Alan, pick up on this, uh, th this, the notion, well, first of all, I want to give you a chance to, let's, let's just kill off innovator's dilemma here and then I have a question <laughs> for you. Well, I, <clears throat> some, uh, Gordon Bell and I particularly have occasionally found ourselves at the same meeting with Christensen. And one of the examples that Christensen- And they're like this. Liked in his, uh, to use in his book were examples about deck, and those examples did not resemble the deck that Gordon had worked at. For he was the CTO of deck and responsible for many of the deck successes and stuff. And certainly, I, as a close observer of deck over the years, did not recognize it. And part of the fallacy there was saying, uh, yes, you know disruptions come along and therefore uh, we have to forgive the managers for uh, being caught up short. But on the other hand, what is a manager being paid for in the 20th century if not to deal with change? Yes, exactly. This is completely misreading what the 20th century is actually all about. And it simply says that a lot of managers are getting paid a lot of money for not being very competent at what the real content of the 20th century is, which in large part is dealing with change. Yes. It's not just dealing with the day to day. And so that's my fundamental argument with Christensen, that I don't think the managers should be excused yes. for that. And I think managers should be paid for dealing with change and they should, should learn how. And then the other, the other part, which I think is very important, and I'm, the, the, I, the timeless, thing was, I think, embedded in the ARPA ethos because of Licklider's desire for what he called the intergalactic network back in the early 60s. And they asked him, why do you call it the intergalactic network? And he says, well, engineers always deliver the minimum. <laughs> <clears throat> so he, he thought by delivering the minimum on an intergalactic network, you'd at least get an internet, which is, which is what happened. Um, so if you, but the, the interesting thing about that design, and it was contrasted with the difficulties AT&T had of redoing their system every few years as their service expanded and so forth. And those of us who are old enough to remember, it was really amazing how bad AT&T was at being able to deal with these things, and partly because the architecture wasn't very good, but also partly because they weren't thinking about how to make a system that you could actually change without stopping. And so the, the internet, something on the size that Licklider wanted, could not be stopped in order to change it, and thus it leapt from being like almost any mechanical thing that we were used to in the 20th century to being something more like a biological organism, mm -hmm. which renews itself even at the atomic level almost completely. We cycle, recycle essentially all the atoms in our body every seven years. <clears throat> and of course, at the cellular level uh, uh, on, either, uh, on even shorter periods. And so things live a long time in biology because parts of them are being allowed to die and they're being renewed over and over again. And so Dan Ingalls here, I get a chance and wave, let, wave Dan. It's, 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 they, and Larry Tesler over there. Larry, would you? And 
John Schock over there, uh, three of uh, the co my colleagues at Xerox Park, and we got into the idea of maybe, can't, can't you make a software system like that? Can't you make a software system that essentially can be alive and active while you're making major changes in it? And we were successful in doing that. Now all of a sudden you have something like a timeless software system where the most powerful tools that you have are actively participating in getting the next versions of the software out. So this is an idea that started showing engineering promise. Um, my, my story uh, about this was while we were doing all this, of course, you know things and you don't exactly know things, but um, when the Ethernet had been running for a couple of years, Bob Sproul did uh, some tests on it and discovered first that it was less efficient than it should be by factors of two and three, and so they looked at it, they found a bug in the algorithm. Nobody had complained because it had been working perfectly, but when they fixed the bug, uh, it sped up by a factor of two or three and nobody noticed. And during this, they found uh, that there was a machine that was about a factor of 100 slower in getting packets out. And they talked to the owner of the Alto, and uh, this guy hadn't noticed. And they were puzzled about it. And they, the, in the Ethernet in those days was a coax cable about a half an inch thick, and you stuck a hypodermic needle right into it, right into the center of the thing. And they finally discovered that the needle had bent on the way in, and so it hadn't really gotten to the center. And so the, there are only parasitics. The signal-to-noise ratio is horrible, but nobody had noticed. <laughs> because the Ethernet, every once in a while, would pump out a packet, and this guy would get his printing done and stuff. And so they fixed that, and it worked faster, and the owner didn't notice. And <laughs> so Sproul and I looked at each other, and we said, holy shit. This, you know, this, is, a, this is a turning point where we must, you know, we must never make anything that ever breaks. That's, that's in the past, things that break and you fix them. We have to have things that are always going to work, and all you can do is improve them, that they're going to be there. And, the, and so when we look at the world today, we see an internet that does this, and yet every month or so you get an email from the sysadmins in your organization saying such and such server will be out of action for the next day or so because we're doing maintenance on it. And when I get one of those, I fire off a reply saying, what, are you kidding? A server is just a name. You can't take the server out of, just take the hardware out. Don't take the name out of service. So what we've got right now is the real future being coped with by people who are still thinking in using past tropes. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we have to learn how to, how to deal with now that this technology is pervasive that if you're going to do an eternal system, the question is, is what does it mean to do maintenance on an, an eternal system and so forth? I have a change. I want to come back on a change question. But first, Michelle, at an operational level, you both share this vision. Practical tips on how you pull this off? The, uh, the continuous reinvention of ourselves uh, has to happen in, in everything that we do. So we, we um, you know, we, we do this, uh, we practice this. I had, um, I don't know, Ellen, if you remember, almost, almost four years ago, um, SAP was not viewed as a very innovative company. And uh, um, one night, uh, Hasso, Hasso Plattner, by the way, Ellen worked with Hasso, um, what, 25 years ago? A thousand ago? years ago. <laughs> <laughs> In uh, the, um, and he, he said that you have to work on intellectually renewing SAP. And at the time, it wasn't clear what that would mean, uh, what that meant, what that would take. Um, my first instinct was, uh, after a few weeks of thinking, that we have to build a product that re uh, not only is an, inno an innovative product that, that is successful in the market and so forth, but um, we have to build one that is exemplary in how, um, how we build it, that others can look at it and, and say, wow, look at what, the, what these guys did, and if they did it, then I could do it too. And uh, Barbara, where did Barbara go? Barbara is here. She was the product manager of the HANA project. 
and uh, many, many of the colleagues from the HANA team are here in the audience. Um, all around the world, especially in Germany, uh, centered in Germany with our leader Franz and uh, we did this. We built this product in just a little bit less than a an year and uh, but then as we started to think more about it, um, building the product, building this great innovation was, was one thing. Um, getting others to look at this and also renew themselves was, was also not easy. Um, it, it requires rethinking all our assumptions, um, breaking ourselves from our own context as, as, as Alan said. Um, we were building products on 18 month cycles and it was, it is an incredibly antique way of building things. We had to change the way that we, we build things. So I asked Sam who is sitting right here to start building new kinds of products directly for consumers um, on 90 day cycles. And he thought about it, he and Philip, I don't know if Philip is here. Uh, they, the first thing they came to me and talked about it was that, um, I mean I have nine buildings in Palo Alto in our lab and they came and said that we don't want to work here. They did not like the buildings and they wanted to go to downtown Los Altos and uh, get themselves a different building. And, uh, and I said sure. Uh, they went and they bought furniture from Ikea and uh, um, you know put it up there with open workspaces. This is also something Alan, you have talked about uh, higher ceilings and things that are conducive to, to thinking, to open work. Um, actually the biggest issue that we ran into was uh, Philip uh, charged his credit card with the furniture that he bought at Ikea and it was not easy to get refunded on those things. <laughs> <laughs> it, it required a board approval, <laughs> a board exception. I'll, I'll bet you could get a lot of stories like that out of the <laughs> group that's here. <laughs> exactly. So we, we broke in, we broke all these kinds of molds down to the very, you know, way that we document things, the way we, the way we work, the way we learn, um, even the places that we work in. And uh, you have to rethink every one of those things. That is our burden. Uh, if we don't, then we die, then, then, we, then we stop growing. So I still want to ask this question about change, but hearing the Ikea story, I, I can't resist but ask. So just a quick TTY interrupt on the change part. Uh, so what do you think about Yahoo's work at home no more policy? Oh my God. Is that uh, conducive to creativity? Well, Shabana is here. She stopped me from writing a blog about it. Um, well, but look, I think now I am here and, and worry, I can- There's I nobody can, blogging this, so. I can, perhaps I can speak my mind. I'm, who knows what the internal dynamics of the company were and I'm sure they are incredibly smart people. But on the surface, at least how it came across to us outside, this is a very, very bad idea. It's a, it's, it's, it's works, it goes against everything that we have learned in the last many decades. The whole idea of, um, of what we learned about communications and, and remote work and, and so forth is, is to be able to collaborate and work together and come to shared perspectives no matter where we are. And this is such a giant step backwards on that. It yeah, is incredible. I mean, the, the, you know, they say a pessimist is a person who sees difficulty in every opportunity and an optimist is a person who sees opportunity in every difficulty. And I think Marissa chose the, the wrong path because, you know, besides the principles we're talking about, why don't they do a system that allows the work from home to be done much better and what a product that would be for Yahoo. Yeah. They actually have the infrastructure to actually, and there really isn't a great product for doing collaborative work remotely yet and they completely blew the opportunity to practice on themselves yes. and then become a leader in a, a whole area that hasn't really even been developed yet. Yeah. So this to me is complete nuts. So as you say that, I get this sinking feeling that she really missed a big opportunity for transformation here. I think so. Yeah, I agree. Even though, even if it was gonna be difficult, so what? Yeah. Well, you know, let's talk about that difficult part. That, and I, you know, think of Vishal when you were, you know, making the changes at SAP. Let's face it, the company was under real stress yes. at that point. By the way, Larry, I think, Larry, weren't you the chief scientist of Yahoo for a while? No. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were. I, ran the, I was a fellow and I ran the uh, user experience team behind Oh, okay. Okay, so since Larry ducked, does anybody else want to take responsibility <laughs> for Yahoo? <laughs> 
Stand up, Larry. There was one guy in my group that worked at home, and it was never a problem. I just uh, can't imagine what, what uh, motivated him. Yeah. Something must have happened. Yeah, something, something drastic must have happened. Okay, well, next shout out, we gotta get a mic to these people. We're gonna have him repeat that in about 15 minutes. Um, but the stress thing, in Silicon Valley, we have, we, we put this wonderful um, uh, nostalgic tinge on the notion of innovation. And, and yet, we all know down our heart of hearts that, I mean, innovation is something you only do when you're under stress. I mean, in the biologic world, it's called mutation and a species only do it when they absolutely have to. Do we not understand innovation and transformation in the valley? Well, I think um, I'm gonna leave aside the biology for a second. So okay. the thing is we can't help mutating. So we don't do it when we have to, we do it all the time and it either matters or it doesn't. That's kind of the it's way- It's either it, lethal it's or- It's kind of the way it works, but, um, no, I don't think, you know, Regis McKenna def a long time ago uh, defined, he was a, a he is, he is. He, yeah, but he, he was one of the most influential people in Silicon Valley um, some years ago, and he wanted to make a real distinction between invention and innovation. Yeah. And so he didn't like the invention and innovation being lumped together because there's a, a kind of people who do invention and there's a kind of people who like to take ideas to market. And that was his basic distinction. And sometimes the same people do it, but very often they're different kinds of people. They have to be funded uh, differently. And I think that the, uh, I think one of the strengths of Silicon Valley was the, the VC community uh, in the late 70s in early 80s, it was a huge factor. It tied in with the other synergies that had happened from uh, some years ago of Terman uh, being around, setting up uh, companies, and of Shockley deciding to take his initial semiconductor company into, into the valley, and that mutating through Fairchild and into Intel and, and so forth. So there are a lot of different things that gave rise to Silicon Valley, but I think it was the, the sum total, the ecology, that gradually shifted the influence in, um, in um, inventive and innovative technology. Uh, as somebody once put it some years ago, uh, that the center of gravity at some point shifted west of the Bayshore Freeway out here, and this is when Silicon Valley really went from being a name to a kind of phenomenon. And so I don't think, I don't think it's uh, very well understood because I think the hardest thing to, to do for VC uh, situations the way they are now and even the way they were when you could do IPOs was the question is, uh, of, uh, it's not the product I'm working on now, this is the number one thing, and, in doing innovation is it's product number two. And so as you're finishing off getting the, this thing going to market when you should be spending uh, all the time in the world that you have crafting the thing, you actually have to have this other thing ready to go. It just wasn't set, accepted by VCs unless there was, they could see a sort of a pipeline that yeah. was being set up. And most of the books about how VC is done uh, have this as a, have a, as a prime thing. And, you think about it, that's maybe not the best way of doing it because it's actually trying to drive things much more commercially than thinking of, hey, what we're trying to do is first, before we create money, we're trying to create wealth. We can think of wealth as the potential. For instance, the Alto at Xerox Park is gonna have its 40th anniversary about 10 days from now. Wow. And that machine created trillions of dollars of wealth because it actually enabled a bunch of stuff to get, to get done that everybody in this room and most of the people in the world have wound up benefiting from. That's the big stuff. So one of the ways of looking at businesses are, are only interested in making millions and billions and true invention and innovation is in the trillion dollar range because it actually changes the entire ecology 
of how we deal with energy and information. And I think that's what's been lacking to me as an old timer looking at the last 30 years. It's been completely mundane. To me, nothing has happened in the last 30 years except scaling. It's just there have been hardly any new inventions you can point well, to. Scaling and angry birds. Scaling and angry birds, whatever you want. The angry birds pooping on everybody. <laughs> so, but, I, but think about it. Think about some, some big idea that people are doing today, and if we trace it back, I guarantee you we can find the invention of it before 1980. That means things are seriously in arrears, and they're in arrears because the funding that actually funded the inventions hasn't been around for more than 30 years. And the businesses have not taken up the slack, and NSF has not taken up the slack. So government step back and business isn't taking up so slack. If you, yeah, because businesses are just ex tending to exploit and being like hunting and gathering tribes, stripping areas drive and moving on, whereas businesses need to invent agriculture. They need to at least get themselves back to 9,000 BC and start thinking about, hey, we live on a finite planet with finite resources, and the, uh, the fact that we're able to do anything depends on scientists and engineers who have made energy available from various resources over the year. All wealth stems from, from that. Most business, business people, when you tell them about this, they haven't got the faintest idea where all this stuff comes from. It's like they've been led into a fertile valley made for them by God, and it's up to them to strip it dry. That isn't going to last. It just isn't going to last. So, Vishal, you're, you're in a position where you deal with these issues every day. Alan has the luxury. He's got a, 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 a yet his. Have you ever tried to run a nonprofit? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I, 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 I spent two I decades trying I, to run a nonprofit. I wouldn't, that's call why, it a, I wouldn't call it a luxury. That's, that's why my new pro company is a for profit. Um, <laughs> but, but at a policy level, Vishal, you, I mean, you are passionate about, you know, that we need to tackle the new grand challenges. At the same time, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're responsible for the innovation at the company. The government, our government is stepped back um, and it, it doesn't show any sign of a return to the context out of which the ARPANET came. So it's up to business to It's transform. up to business. It's up how, to us. How do we do it? It's up to us in business to, to understand where things come from. This is what Alan was talking about. To, to appreciate the value of invention. We have, we have to, we have to think about this. Um, I look at, you know, we are great, we are a totally diverse company around, we are operating around the world. I have teams uh, literally in every time zone. And, um, and yet you look at the state of video conferencing or, or telepresence and things like this. And we were debating this last week or so when we were last together, that the basic idea of eye contact is not there. Everybody who has seen video conferences, we are used to the fact that like, you are sitting here, but I'm talking to you looking up there. So and how think, come you haven't fixed this? Yeah, we have to. I mean, there are certain no, things. No, I said, how come you haven't? Well, <laughs> um, I mean, you've got, you've got lots of really good software programs. Oh, this is not a bad idea. <laughs> why, why don't we fix it, Alan? We should, we should well, I think it. we should. Don't we should you? fix it, yeah. Well, Alan, I mean, when you, you were at Applied Minds, they had a prototype that fixed yeah. it. Yeah, well, actually, yeah. the. You know, the whole eye contact study was a, uh, won a golden fleece from Senator Proxmire in the 70s. Nicholas Negroponte did a pro uh, project for uh, a different branch of ARPA that was called Talking Heads. And the nature of the project was to find out what you had to have at the receiving end to allow various kinds of discussions and arguments to take place, including ones that required eye contact. And that the, and they went to, they did everything you could possibly think of and a bunch of things you wouldn't think of. And it got poo-pooed by Congress in the late 70s and hardly anything has been done since. A couple of companies have done a few things. So I've, I've been looking at the literature on this and Microsoft, for example, uh, did something. Hewlett Packard some years ago did something. The Halo system? The, well, the, not the Halo system. A mere system. half million dollars it, plus it wasn't, 30 thousand a month. Yeah, was it, the, was it the Halo? So I wasn't talking about the Halo system, oh, okay. but you can if you like. <laughs> no, no. Okay, so uh, no, it was a, another system that tried to 
find a way of placing people in the same communicative space yeah. with, eye, with eye contact that never became a product. So people have, have taken shots at it. The interesting thing about it is um, when you look at it technologically today, um, the computer, computer power and the amount of cost to actually do this uh, is reasonable. So uh, the interesting thing is why haven't companies uh, that are selling telecommunication stuff starting to offer, th offer this yet, and they aren't. Yeah. So maybe we will have to do it. So, so I mean, yeah, exactly. My, my, my sense is that these things are not at odds with each other. If we think hard enough, if we work hard enough, that purposeful problems um, uh, are not necessarily at odds with things that can be commercially successful. Uh, and this, this notion of, of agriculture, of, of creating long-term opportunities uh, for us is something that is extremely important. I had, um, when we were doing the uh, early work with HANA, one of uh, our customers is a customer in, in India. Uh, it's a large bank, the la largest private bank in India. Uh, and uh, Mr. Kamath is the chairman and he's a mentor of mine. Uh, he, he said that um, if this HANA technology is so fancy, you should do something interesting with it, something purposeful with it. And he gave us a few interesting examples of problems that could be used to solve it. India, you know, 80% of people in India don't have a bank account. And uh, they are working on this digital identity project, which will give identities to Indians, you know, for the many Indians for the first time ever. And uh, his own bank uh, will have, right now they have 65 million consumers. And um, in the next five years, they will have something like six or 700 million consumers. And so he was thinking about, you know, what are the kinds of ways that you could solve problems of giving small amounts of credit to hundreds of millions of people. And we worked on things like this. So uh, things that are important from a societal point of view and things that are important um, from a commercial point of view don't have to be at odds with each other. Even if it, it takes a little bit longer to get something, some of these things done. Uh, we've been working on healthcare. I mean, if you look at healthcare, um, if you look at it from the point of view, you know, that, that Alan, Alan was talking about, the separating ourselves from the context, but yet looking at the situation the way it is today, we are in the dark ages you know, when it comes to healthcare. Um, we measure our health and our well-being by looking at blood tests and things like this once a year with partial information and you, you get this, this cholesterol reading and you somehow are supposed to make judgments about what to do with your life based on this. It is, it is incredible the amount of time it takes to process the, uh, the, the genome information and correlate that with everything else that is known about you um, and then come to some kind of an interesting conclusion beyond just blasting the, you know, the, the, the issue that is known with, with uh, equivalents of nuclear weapons inside the body. Um, and I don't know if, if any of you go to India and, and get the famous Delhi belly. Um, there is a medicine that every doctor in India prescribes is norfloxacin, which is like dropping a nuclear bomb inside your digestive system. Uh, it destroys everything. And um, uh, this is how we practice medicine. It is, it is incredible that we don't see the opportunity in that. Or, or in, in IT, we look at IT systems. My goodness, I mean, uh, Karen, you talked about one of the big oil companies, uh, president who is going to come here and talk. Uh, another one, not, not Shell, but a different one, and I'm not going to name this. Uh, um, a massive oil company, one of the largest in the world. Um, I was talking about long-lived systems, Alan. I think you know this story. Um, and we have a customer, a chemical company, that runs two of their countries on R2. Um, now, you know, R3 is 20 years old. So R2 was before that. R2 was actually end of life in 1991. These are not the droids we were looking for. <laughs> it was, it was, this was, this was R2-D2's cousin. No, no, not that R2. <laughs> Probably there was an yeah. experience there. <laughs> the, uh, and I'm, I'm mentioning this story that this particular, uh, as far as I knew at that time, this was the only R2 installation in the world. And this great oil company said that they, no, it's not true. We still run Canada on R2 to this day. Um, a system that we end of life uh, 22 years ago. So when we look at the complexity in the IT landscape, it can be simplified by factors of tens of thousands, by factors of, by five, maybe even six orders of magnitude. 
uh, we have the ability, we have the understanding, we have the architectural and technical understanding, the scientific understanding of what it takes to achieve these kinds of dramatic simplifications. Um, we have to have the will to go after those big problems um, and, uh, uh, and the know-how of course beyond the will. The, uh, in the book that we wrote in Allen's, on Allen's 70th birthday, uh, Danny Hillis wrote a great um, chapter, the last chapter in the book where he talked about the three ingredients of these kinds of things. This is knowledge, imagination and conviction. Um, in design thinking, there is a similar trilogy of desirability, feasibility and viability, um, which are the human factors, the technical or engineering factors and, and the commercial or economic factors. But you have to have the knowledge, the imagination and the conviction to make these things happen. Um, and uh, I think it is up to the leaders, especially the leaders and the people who call the shots these days and these are the commercial, big commercial companies. It is our imperative to go after the big problems and at SAP we are fortunate to, to go after them, you know, in, in energy, in, um, in education, in, in uh, healthcare. These are the big problems of our times. If we do not go after them, well, who will? Well, at the same time, I think it's a sign of the Valley's health that we have small groups going after it. In healthcare, we've got quantified self. There's the whole make movement going on and the like, and, and we have some interesting, I mean, the, I think the one could say the biggest advances in education innovation right now are things like Ustacity and Coursera that are both coming out of the Valley. Say more, Alan. No, and that, that, that's... It, it'll eventually get better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not. But 40 minutes ago, you told me actually, its software hasn't gotten any better. So. No, but I mean the 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 inter to me the most interesting thing about the MOOCs is how popular they are. Yeah. So far beyond any actual merits that they have at this point. And the thing I'm most worried about is the backlash because uh, we, the, you know, especially in this country, we have a tendency of getting really excited about something that really isn't that exciting, but is the <laughs> start of something, and then uh, having a backlash and souring on it and killing it off for decades when it actually needed to be nurtured. And of course, there's the famous story of when Faraday was showing uh, Disraeli, the prime minister of India, of England, uh, one of his first little electric motors, and Disraeli said to him, well, of what use is this? And Faraday said, of, of what use is a newborn baby? And Disraeli didn't get it. <laughs> and most of the, most of the people, because the, the, idea of nur the idea of having a relatively long tail to nurture, so most people don't realize that the ARPA funding started in 1962. And Park wouldn't have happened except for the Vietnam War, which curtailed that funding. It got Taylor to look around for some additional funding source to finish off what had already been eight years of funding. So Park started in 1970, and the what seemed to be like lightning uh, strikes of inventions right and left there for the first four or five years were actually built on eight years in an entire community and creating graduates, not just inventions, but also creating the graduate students who became the PhDs and went to Xerox Park to do the thing. And so personal computing, which has returned well in excess of $30 trillion now from a few dozen people at Xerox Park. So the other thing that's interesting is actual invention is usually cheap. Mm -hmm. um, the reason companies don't like it isn't because it's expensive, it's because they have to give up control yeah. on the inventors and they hate that. <laughs> Most managers would rather be completely in control of mediocre processes than feel out of control on something that might be good. And that is probably the deepest problem that, that we have to, have to face. So when you're thinking about this, when you're thinking about this stuff, uh, the Question is, is there any process that you can imagine today that could fund something more or less continuously for 13 years just to make a mere $35 trillion for the world? P 
people don't think in terms of that time scale or that payoff. What people are doing now is doing tiny little funding for tiny little payoffs, and the problem is that doesn't escape you from the context that you're in. You stay in the context that you're in until you run out of ideas entirely. That's the flaw in, in what we're doing today. So, Vishal, why don't can't we, we do this anymore? Uh, of course we can. We have to. Um, we, we have to. One, one great analogy, I don't know, Alan, if you remember, you once told me was, um, if a monkey continue, you know, if a monkey is trying to get to the moon by climbing ever taller trees, uh, in some mathematical sense, you are getting closer to the moon, but you know, you're not going to make it there. Um, <laughs> and uh, so you have to think about a, um, a way to break out of the context and, and do something that is radically different. I mean, we, we have projects that we are working on that we are thinking about where we think about. Now let me stop you there because we're talking about creating things that are radically different. And yet the context, what Alan is talking about with Park was you need the continuity for the seedbed to get that tail going for change. Yeah, but the context, the context of that continuity has to be different than what's normal in the world around you. So then what was important yeah. was that's why visions are the most important thing. And it's why uh, one of the many smart things that Licklider did was he declined to ever articulate a goal from Washington. They asked him, well, why don't you have goals? And he says, well, you can't really make good goals behind the beltway. Right. Even more true today. What he said is, so he says, I, I have a vision that the destiny of computers is to become complementary intellectual amplifiers for everybody in the world, <coughs> pervasively networked worldwide. And he stuck to that, and this allowed him to fund people who actually did not agree with each other. This is one of the strengths. Of course, but, but he, had the luxury, he had the luxury of doing this before the internet. It was easier to get away from Washington. And you know, California has a long tradition <laughs> of, of you know, innovation I wish happens. we could blame the internet on what's wrong with Washington. So, yeah, well, I see. I'm afraid. Uh, they don't know how to I'm, type. I'm but. afraid the, the, the problems are far, far deeper. But my favorite example of that was there, the, part of the reason why Hollywood's in Hollywood, uh, I think Alan knows this story that um, all the, the theater owners on Broadway, when movies were invented, they said, oh my God, this is the end of the theater business. You know, we gotta get into this movie thing. And they went to Edison and he wanted to charge him an arm and a leg for license to his patents. And so they did what all good entrepreneurs would do. And they said, well, we'll just violate the patents. And, um, and, and the official part of the story is they moved out to California for the sunlight, but the other dimension to it was they also wanted to get as far from New York as possible so that they would have advance notice if the lawyers that were coming out. That is why Park was set up in Palo Alto, was right. to be as far away from Stanford, Connecticut as possible. I except that the one detail you guys can do, the reason why they chose Hollywood over San Mateo, which is where they tried doing Hollywood, was it also happened to be close to the Mexican border. And so they kept agents at the station in New York. And if it looked like they were sending the suits out to serve them, they yeah. figured they could pop across to Tijuana. We should have thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a much better service. Much, much better. But, yeah. but, but Michelle, I mean, uh, how do you balance this, this, you know, the long nurturing and then the imperative of transformation? We have to have um, a company, SAP is 65,000 people. We have to have the ability to take 50 great, you know, people aside and let them work on the on the, on the blue plane, on the, on the, on the unencumbered uh, approaches towards the great problems. Uh, and uh, we can instill a sense of purpose uh, in uh, the problems that, that everybody is working on. The, um, I'll, I'll give you a, a few examples. So it is not that um, doing the radical, doing the really breakthrough things requires us to do something totally crazy. It is, you can see that in the present context. You can see, I mean, for instance, um, if you look at communication, the great purpose of communication is really for more than one, you know, several people to come together to a shared perspective, a common uh, shared perspective. And are the technologies and the techniques that we use today able to get us there? And we can identify the weaknesses in, in the techniques that we use today, uh, in how complex they are in helping us achieve a shared perspective. Um, and yet the 
whole point of communication of sitting together of meetings of collaboration is to get to you know sing from the same sheet of music or whatever the management types call it um, being on the same page and all our eggs in one basket or I don't know wood behind the arrow or whatever uh. well, all, I, <laughs> all I can say is clearly you do it well because and you certainly do it better than Xerox did because I was thinking you know Xerox people had to go all the way across the continent to get a way to innovate. You know, we just heard just a little while ago, your people only have to go to Los Altos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we are also doing the uh, building renovations inside our campus itself. So it is not always necessary to break out and go somewhere else. Uh, you have to be able to renew from within as well. Yeah. The um, um, one thing that I would say, and um, when, you, when you think about breaking out of the context, um, Amplification of our reach of, we, we can look at the great technologies and why they worked and what they led to. I mean the HANA project in the end took us about an year, but we worked on it for a long time. Um, the T-Rex project started 12 years before um, I started working on, within three months of joining SAP, it was clear to me that a next generation database had to be built because SAP's applications de depended on a database and the our SAP's primary competitor was the largest provider of databases to SAP's application. So it was not an act of genius to figure out that a new database had to be built. And I called Geo, who was one of my advisors, and I said, Geo, SAP has to build a new database in order to survive. What should we do? And he pointed me to one of his former students uh, who had built an in-memory database in Korea. Uh, this is Geo Wiederholt. Yeah, Geo Wiederholt was one of my, one of my uh, PhD advisors. And um, I met Sang, Sang Cha, in October of 2002, uh, I managed to convince SAP to buy his company in June of 2005, only three years later. Um, we uh, originally plotted, Franz and Daniel and I plotted to build HANA uh, at that time in June 2005. Uh, we were sure that this has to be done. Um, Hasso started doing research on it at the HPI in 2006. Actually, I started the first HANA project in August of 2006 because Hasso had this idea that based on his research that you could do on the fly calculations. And then uh, by 2009, he wrote the paper for Sigmund and argued with Stonebreaker and all that. Um, and then it was clear that now this has to be done. Um, so it, the end was, uh, happened quite quickly, but um, we worked on it for a very long time. Uh, I mean, 12 years, uh, Alan, you talked about, it took us about that long to go from the idea. And Jim Gray wrote the paper on, uh, uh, shrinking the peta cube in his Turing Award lecture, he talked about that. That was the motivation for bringing a text search technology to analytics. This was uh, in 2001 or so. Uh, so it takes a long time to get the big things done. And I want to talk about that long time. First of all, we're, we're now going to go to questions, so there are going to be mics making their way around. If you see a mic near you and you want to ask a question, raise your hand. Um, and where are the mics at the moment? One here? One here, awesome, okay. As I listen to Vishal Allen, and I think about transformation, I go back to Stephen Jay Gould and Nils Eldridge, and given that we live through revolutions here and we talk about evolution, we, we, as a valley, we don't seem to have a very sophisticated view. So let me ask you this straight up. Is this a process of punctuated equilibrium? <laughs> well, and, and in just context, so evolution, if you think of a straight line going into the future, that's kind of steady state notion. The revolution that uh, Stephen Jay Gould had was Proposed. That, okay, proposed. Uh, it, it, looks pretty, <laughs> it looks like it holds up pretty well to me. Um, that it stops and starts. So you have a burst that goes up, it levels off for a little while, then you get a, a, a burst. And this, this pops up in different ways. I mean, this, this is Schumpeter's notion of creative destruction. Yeah, uh, and others. I mean, is, is that the way transformation happens? Well, I think the if you look if you look at the profit motive as intersecting heavily with the, with the valley, there when some new thing comes along, uh, it's going to consume a lot of resources in uh, various kinds of exploitation. I think one of the most interesting things to those of us who were at Park was uh, the inability of the Valley 
to uh, take the whole set of inventions. So uh, the, the Apple and uh, IBM PCs uh, were sold without a, without a network because, and somebody asked Steve Jobs once, where's your network, and he tossed a floppy disk at them, at them because they didn't have this larger context that Licklider had bequeathed uh, to us. And so, so each of the things that were done, by, again, by this about two dozen people in a few years that created a, a complete system of local area nets and um, Park also had its own internet, as you probably know, the PUP stuff. So it was a complete deal and yet nobody, even though it only took a few dozen people to invent it and make thousands of copies of the thing, uh, the entire valley and Route 128 could not deal with all of the ideas at once. In order to exploit it, they had to take each one of these things piecemeal. Turned out to be a disaster uh, as far as uh, making def bad de facto standards because a lot of things were set in place, including just like the Intel 86 architectures. I know you're a, you're a big fan of the internet. I am a big fan of the internet. Architecture-wise? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I mean, sorry, no, of the World Wide Web. Oh, yeah, well, that's, so that's a completely different thing. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think the, well, let's not, let's not okay. go off. Well, let's go to a question, and we'll, we'll work our way yeah. back then. So who's, uh, questions? Uh, raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you. Good. And the way this works is comment, so two things. One, if you have a comment, you don't need to make it a question. Uh, there are lots of smart people in this room. Just let, put your comment out there. Uh, Tom Fremsky, Silicon Valley Watcher. And I was wondering where, where would the uh, uh, funding for research of the kind that you were talking about, what, what area would that go into? I know you're, you've been talking a lot about software and the need to kind of create a Moore's Law around software. Um, uh, uh, is that the area where we need the funding the most? Well, let's, so it, let's take a look at two, two like, so Park, you could think of as a kind of payoff. One of the payoffs there uh, uh, Vishal has been talking about, which is the idea that hardware and software are just two aspects of the same thing. They're all about process, and hardware is just software crystallized early. So it's a real mistake to just take hardware as a given and try and make it look nice by putting so So HANA was an attempt to design an entire system uh, which had uh, more felicitous hardware, and then they did a lot of software work on it. So Park was all about that. Uh, uh, a number of the things that we did were already being uh, prototyped before the Alto was done. The Alto was influenced by the software rather than the other way around. Um, so the where does the funding come from? Well, so I talked to Rick Jones, who was actually the controller of Park. Um, not too long ago, we, he and I had lunch, and I asked him, well, Rick, how much did, uh, what do you estimate the, uh, and he had all the records. He was a, he was a money guy. So, uh, so he actually went, went, into his, uh, went into his stash in his house and looked up, and, and the computer part of Park, over the 10 years that it was active there, averaged out to less than $10 million a year in today's money. In today's so, money. So when I, in today's money. So when I, when I, uh, when you ask a question like that, my answer is, well, geez, every Fortune 500 company wastes that amount of money every other week. Yeah. They could have a park anytime they wanted to. The problem is they don't want to, no matter what they say. Yes. And yes. The, the, the mantra that goes along mm. with that is that everybody loves change except for the change part. <laughs> As, as right, Mark Twain put it, I'm all for progress. It's change I object to. Exactly. So people sit around tables. And, and the, the problem with this is that people are quite genuine. Is you, it's not a question of hypocrisy. People do realize they need change. The problem is they can't, in, when it comes right up to it, they can't muscle up the additional yeah. amount of will that it takes to actually change themselves because they're part of this ecology. Exactly. That, so, is, a, that is a huge... 
So, so, so it's which, not a question. Which area yeah. should, should the funding go into? Well, I think, uh, so what Licklider. Where would you spend the money so today? On smart people. This is what Licklider, Lick, when they asked. Well, Google does that, right? What, what, what they, a, they asked Licklider, uh, you know, uh, what are your goals? And he says, well, I, I don't have goals. I have this, we're going to fund visions rather than goals, and we're going to fund people rather than projects. So the idea is that if you have a good, visions are very important because they are an, uh, kind of a picture of a desired future state without necessarily having enough details to uh, force a path there. But it's just, here's where we'd like to get, we'd like to get to world peace. That's a vision, not a goal. Goals are how you, how you actually get there. And so if you have visions, and the vision is uh, compelling. It acts like a pole of a magnet. All the little iron filings out there will start pointing to north without even having to talk with each other. And they'll start moving there. And that is, that is how it acts. And so Licklider said, I'm going to fund people rather than projects. And, uh, and they said, well, what about failure? And uh, he said, uh, you know, he said, well, we're not playing golf. So this, I believe this is a problem, actually, in business, that a lot of business people play golf, and losing one stroke is a tragedy in golf. And the problem is, is that uh, research, especially, and invention is much more like baseball. And Licklider was a baseball fan, and, and he said, look, Ty Cobb's lifetime batting average was only 367. So two, two out of three times when he went up to the plate, he was an abject failure. So any business would, fun, would fire this guy in a second. Because, uh, so, so the, he said, look, if you look at what we're funding, if we bat 350, we will change the entire world. That's what happened. And people said, well, what about the 65% failure? And here's the key phrase. Licklider said, 65% failure is the cost of doing research. It's the cost of business and doing research. And businesses have this phrase, cost of doing business. They've never been able to successfully apply it to research but they do apply it to other ephemeral things like advertising and other kinds of things that they pay, giving big parties for their salespeople. That's the cost of doing business. It's thought they don't know really what the return is on that. But for research, because they really don't know anything about it, they are unable to apply any of these principles, like to even ask what is a reasonable success and failure rate if you're doing edge of the art research where you might return trillions. Yeah. The answer is, hey, 30% success, and you're going out after this stuff? That is fantastic. Go every, for it. It's cheap. Good. Every Michelle. business has, ha, has to have the ability, especially the larger companies, to fund a small piece of what they do towards these kinds of things. Um, we are always surprised by you know, radical outcomes that show up in mean, the financial crisis and so forth. And, and we never invest in, um, we rarely invest in things that are you know, out there or, or in, in groups that are thinking about things in an unencumbered manner. And yet, almost every company, pretty much all companies can afford to do that. Um, it is not a big deal. Well, Google has its policy of giving people a percentage of time to work on whatever they want. What yeah. do you think of that? It's good. I mean, Park had something similar. But I think the, and I don't know what the Google internal culture is like these days, so I can't really comment on on it, but I think that the, uh, as, as I understand it, it has, uh, it's rather too much like Slashdot in the sense that it's, there's yeah. way too much contention yeah. over things, and it's really not a question of counting noses as to yeah. whether something, this when is where, you, know, if you, you have, at, a, have a leader so like, like uh, Bob Taylor, uh, <coughs> or the other, the other ARPA leaders, they had a real knack for being uh -huh. able to deal with enormous diversity without letting it get out of control. And I think that is one of the, yes. right? It's a, it's right. a talent for a leader right. and it makes a real, because you need to let things go almost into real chaos, but not over the line. Yeah. Right. And, I, I, and if you look at venture capitalists, right, VCs are fully aware of this notion that two-thirds or 80% of 
companies and ideas fail and uh, and yet we don't apply this to the task of solving some fundamental problems sure um, a, a good way to I think one of his questions was about what should we work on and people always are asking about this and, and Alan always gives a com complicated answer to this because there isn't a straightforward right um, I mean one good way to think about this is there are a set of human activities that we perform every day and we have been for forever uh, as long as humanity has been around and they go through changes in mediums or, or in containers that we perform those on but it's the same set of things. So what are the good amplifiers for these human activities? Um, um, we can always imagine those, we can always think about those and work on those and borrow uh, our learnings from the great amplifiers that have existed before us. So, you know, people are fascinated by, by Facebook reaching a billion people on, on the planet in whatever six years or seven years or whatever it has taken them. And yet, do you remember many years ago you told me the story of Tom Paine, of Thomas Paine and the Common Sense Manifesto. Uh, Thomas Paine wrote this Common Sense Manifesto in 1775 and it got to 900,000 or so of the colonists. Out of 1.5 Out of 1.5 million. million. Almost three-fourths of the population. In six months. Yeah within six months, this is 200 and whatever, 36 years ago, 37 years ago that he got to almost three-fourths of the population in less than a year, um, just you, on the power of, um, I mean, even it was Tom's poke strategy, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're averaging about 12 minutes a question here, and <laughs> so I want to push on <laughs> and at least get one more question in before we, there's a gentleman yes. over here. Hi, um, I'm Vinay Chaudhary from SRI International and uh, I'm curious to know your opinion on if you're working on a long-term problem, say 10 years or longer, how do you really track progress and how do you figure out that you are actually moving forward and since the initial results tend to be very small, when do you really declare a breakthrough? Let me give a 30 second answer to that, maybe Alan then you can add more. Um, I'll give a one hour answer. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have seen the movie Finding Nemo? Oh good. Well there is this great scene where Crush the Sea Turtle says, it's like when they know, you know, you know? <laughs> Ooh, that's heavy man, that's a good <laughs> <laughs> How do you know when you're making progress? Yeah. Well when they know, you know, you know? <laughs> Top that, Alan. <laughs> Can't beat it. That was Andrew Stanton, by the way, the director that, of the movie. Folks, you just had, that was a historic moment. <laughs> I cannot recall a time that I've seen Alan topped by someone. That <laughs> no. He wasn't trying to top me. <laughs> Good. Uh, how about one a question? Oh, we have a microphone on this side. Somebody attached to a microphone? Uh, well, raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. Uh, okay, right. I think that's Ted Kant, yes? Yeah. No, I don't want to break But wait till the mic gets there. I'm Ted Kahn. I owe a great deal to Alan and the group. I used to be one of Alan's projects, he used to call me <laughs> as a graduate student. Um, I'd like you to think back for a second or think forward of what kind of advice you'd give to the kinds of kids we had at Park who are a part of our group um, now in 2012 or 2013 in terms of thinking of their own future since a common phrase of yours is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So pretend there was a group like that right now. What would you be advising them? Well, as I pointed out at the, at the Turing Centenary that the easiest way to predict the future is to prevent it. And so the future that we've had over the last 30 years has been trivial to predict because most of the interesting ideas have been prevented from flowering. It's been mostly about exploiting the ability of the computer to imitate old media and to transport it around in various ways. So uh, I think that the, I, I, I can say that for myself, if I were, I believe if I were an undergraduate in school right now or, or thinking about going to graduate school, I certainly wouldn't go into computer science. It's completely mundane and has lost its point in academia almost completely. And 
So I, I certainly wouldn't be, a, be attracted to it. I would probably go into the, the other love that I had back then, which was molecular biology. And the thing I particularly was interested in back then, which hadn't flowered, has flowered in the last 10 years, which is developmental anatomy uh, driven by, uh, by uh, an organism's genetics. And so, but I think, you know, as a general advice, the uh, people are different. There's this great scene, since you, you, you had a movie reference, I'll pick City Slickers. <laughs> yeah. So he, so Billy Crystal is the tenderfoot, and he's with Jack Palance, the old cowboy, and they're riding along. And Jack, in the middle of the conversation, Jack Palance says to Billy Crystal, he says, "Well, the secret of life is just one thing." And Billy Crystal says, "What is it? What is it?" And Jack Palance says, "That's what you have to find out." <laughs> <laughs> and that is a really profound moment because. People need different advice. It is really hard to step into other people's yes. shoes. And so the, the kind of general advice we're supposed to get is supposed to come from education instead of the vocational training that is now going on in most uh, universities. And if education were still going on, education is about trying to make the invisible visible. As you know, you've worked your whole life on education and so the advice you'd give this kid would be something that uh, you would have given them by helping them deal with the fact that uh, all humans, no matter how enlightened, are blind in so many different ways. It's a property of our nervous system. Francis Bacon wrote movingly about it in uh, 1610. Uh, and the main difference is not whether you're blind or not, but whether you know you're blind. If you know you're blind, you are in a completely different place from a person who thinks that they are sighted but actually blind. If you know you're blind, you will start doing things to try and help deal with this problem. And I mean blind not just sensorily, I mean blind in the ability to actually come to reasonable conclusions. And so I would try and build something around that for every child and let them find their own Jack Pilantz aha moment that brings it home to them in a way that they will never forget for the rest of their lives. I've got a question over in this corner. This is Hari Guleria. I'm with HP. And this is a personal question. Uh, prior to being introduced to Apple, I firmly believed that innovation was the center of you know, growth. Uh, once Steve Jobs comes, he gets in this paradigm where best in class and user friendly becomes the success factor in Apple. Because if you look at it, his, his core is design and user friendliness. So I just wanted your opinion on what is the balancing act between innovation and in, in, in HANA I would say business success or the technology. So it's a balancing act between user friendliness, design, ease of use versus pure innovation. Well, the thing we used to say in the old days was the first word in personal computing is person. Yeah. And if you take Licklider seriously, practically everybody you're trying to help is not like you. That is, they're not technologists. So dealing with that blindness is an, a big deal. And you could argue that of all the technologies that Park brought to fruition, um, the graphical user interface that was actually adaptable to a wide variety of people, over two billion now, was uh, a gating technology. I don't want to, you know, cause we had, all of these technologies had to be invented, but that's the one that is a bridge technology. Mm -hmm. it, it was certainly the, from my point of view, it was the hardest one to come up with good ideas in. It's, it's a lot of different experiments that are mostly failures. Uh, trying to understand what that means. And I think we can praise Steve Jobs for a lot of things, um, including having taste and some vision and, and so forth. Uh, but I'd like you to think about the difference between um, uh, a friendly parent that don't, doesn't let you learn anything 
and a friendly parent that puts you into a place where you have to uh, learn things and become separate from your parent. And if you were to try and characterize uh, what Apple's design has been the last bunch of years, which has been tremendously successful in the marketplace, it's a crippling design. It is anti-personal computer. The manual. Completely. The so the, the iPad uh, is very, very difficult to use in the symmetric. The, in the old days, the idea was it's not just for consumption, it's for symmetric creation. The iPad doesn't exhibit that. The iPad doesn't really have undo. The iPad doesn't have an easy standard way of getting to help about anything. So it's actually been dumbed down so far that it is creating a sense of normal that is distressing. So people now think of the iPhone and the iPad as being kind of a normal way of interacting with, and of course Microsoft has followed suit yeah. with a whole interface based on those ideas, but a lot of them are actually anti-growth in the end users. They're just uh, giving people, you know, a mother uh, to pre prevent them from ever growing. So again, I think this was, you know, Steve Chang, the motto at Apple uh, in the early 80s was wheels for the mind. I mean, it was exciting to be at Apple because uh, there were ideals about uplifting people that were similar to those from the ARPA community. And when Steve came back to Apple, he was rescuing a company, but he also decided just to go after the consumer market without trying to help anybody at all, but just to give the consumer market more convenient ways of what they wanted, but not what they needed. Yeah. Um, I, I would just like to add one thing to that, Paul. I know uh, we are short on time. The, the things that Alan just said, the two, the answers to the two questions, uh, Ted's question and, and this one, are deeply related to each other. The, um, the capabilities in our products to help the end user achieve what they are trying to do by learning and by am amplifying their ability to do things by, their, by themselves um, is, is incredibly important. We have to have ways in our products to help our end users uh, achieve their goals and um, learn as they do things um, by themselves. And if you look at Ted's question, I mean, he's talking about um, giving purpose to well, what advice would you give um, to, to people working on these kinds of problems today. One of the great books uh, written by, in, in, by a German author, Hermann Hesse, was Siddhartha, which was a, a sort of a modern retelling of the Buddha story. and. Um, there is the Siddhartha character has a friend who follows him along his entire life and then at the end he asks Siddhartha, what is it? Why is it that you are so successful and I am not? I did everything that, that you do and I followed you and I followed all your lessons and why is it that I am not? People, you know, adulate you and, and admire you and what am I doing wrong? And he says, don't follow my path, you know, don't follow my purpose, follow your own, find your own. It is something that um, it not only applies to ourselves, but also to the people that we work with, uh, toward the products that we build for the people that work with those products. This is something that uh, has to be at the heart of what we do. Um, and when I, when, I, when I came to SAP, I looked at this idea of package software that, you know, you make one software package for everybody. And, and you look at the reality of our software. It is, it is not that at all. It is every customer, in fact, every user tries to change it. This was when, Alan, you first met Hasso. This was the big idea, was the platform underneath these applications, even though they are so-called packaged applications, but the idea is to enable anybody to be productive with these, to, to be able to do their own thing. And I think finding our great ways to do our own thing um, is, is, is a very basic idea, but it's a great idea. Yeah, I, I, I love that story. Because you, you may know that the European legend of the Holy Grail is an allegory for uh, leading an authentic life. The idea yeah. is you have to take your own path in the woods yeah. to search for, for the Grail, and it was getting away from the standard paths yes. and, and that. So it's, it's a complete dovetailing. 
And it's, it's an interesting thing, and most people don't realize that's what the Grail legend yeah. was actually about. And I think that's an absolutely perfect note to end this evening on. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. to take this opportunity to thank our speakers, Michelle and Alan, for sharing your perspectives so freely, and Paul for guiding the conversation so masterfully, and thank you also for being the optimists that see the opportunity in every difficulty. As a small token of our appreciation, we have for these gentlemen the, what I hope you agree, is a very handsome Churchill Club t-shirt. Please wear it in great health. Thank you again to SAP for your partnership and support. A recording of this program will be available within a day or two on the Churchill Club YouTube channel. And you have been an amazing audience. You go out there and do great things. See you next time.